Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Developer Express. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express controls and libraries. Deliver elegant.net solutions that address customer needs today by leveraging your existing knowledge. You can build next generation touch enabled solutions for tomorrow. You can download your free 30 day trial at dx.hanselminutes.com. That's dx.hanselminutes.com. One more thing. Let me tell you about a new sponsor, Raygun. If you're wanting to detect and diagnose errors and crashes in your software, even find problems that you didn't know existed to improve your software, then Raygun might be perfect for you. You add a few lines of code to your application, and in minutes you'll get real-time error reports with all the information that you need to fix bugs fast. You can even hook it up to your team chat, bug tracking, development workflow tools. Raygun covers all major web and mobile programming languages, including .NET, the full Xamarin stack, JavaScript, and many more. Go check out Raygun today at raygun.io. I use this myself on my little startup, and I really, really recommend this product. It is a great, great product. Check it out, raygun at raygun.io. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 486. In this episode, Scott talks with Dr. Adrian Porterfelt from Google about designing usable security. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And today I'm talking with Dr. Adrienne Porterfeld from Google. She's a security researcher and she's got a PhD in computer science from Berkeley. Thanks for chatting with me today. Great. It's nice to be talking to you. So you have got some really, really interesting publications that talk about some of the things that you work on. You are a security researcher, but security is a big word that talks about a lot of different areas, right? You're not focused on exploits as much as you are about kind of how people think about security. Yeah, that's right. So I'm on the Chrome usable security team, and we try to help Chrome users and developers make safe decisions online. So although we are engineers and designers, our main focus is on building tools that people can use in a way that keeps them secure. It seems like we always talk about today's internet is not yesterday's internet. I'm always getting screenshots from my mom or my non-technical dad. You know, my parents are not technical. uh, And they'll be like, is this a safe thing to click? And they'll be in the middle of an activity, then something will happen, and they'll take a screenshot of it and they'll mail it to me. And they'll leave it there for hours because of fear that that clicking this button, it might be a fake pop-up, it might be a screen, you know, it might be a even a screenshot of a fake Chrome dialogue. Um, it's getting to the point where they just don't know how to do anything on the internet without being afraid that someone's going to steal their uh, their credit cards. Like, why is this today's internet? Yeah, that's really unfortunate. And actually, we see a pretty wide range of different reactions to the threat of malware and phishing and other things online. So from talking to people, we find that um, non-experts tend to to be somewhere on a spectrum between, like your parents, somewhat paralyzed by fear of what's out there online, um, sometimes justifiably, um, to, on the other end, people who feel like they're invincible on the internet. So we talk to people and they say things like, I use Linux, so nothing can hurt me. Or, oh, I can do whatever I want online because I have antivirus installed. Um, not realizing really that, you know, oh, your antivirus might not protect you from phishing. So it, it is difficult to build tools that address this huge huge range of people who have different levels of technical expertise and also different uh, levels of risk tolerance and and fear. Is it something that should be automatic? Is security, like, I'm thinking about my my own life security, right? Uh, I lock my front door and I lock my car and I don't park in dodgy neighborhoods and I'm trying to think what else do I do? I don't know. Look people in the eye when I walk by them. I mean, I, like personal security is a pretty much a thing where it's like, well, just be safe out there and use good sense. 
But that good sense came over 20 years of growing up in my town and understanding my town. Is that the difference? Is it those that are born on the web understand security or are they just as clueless as my parents? I actually think sometimes that the more experience someone has online, the more blind they become to risks that are there. So it very much depends. But I I do agree with you. I think an, a good end goal would be for people to not have to think about security in order to remain secure. So when I get in my car and I drive to work or to the grocery store, I have airbags, right? And I'm sure there are steel mm. beams and all these other safety mechanisms in my car. And I don't think about them. I just you know, try not to hit things. And I would like to, to get to a place where using technology is the same way, where people who are using computers don't have to think about security unless there is a very specific question that we need to ask them. But this is very difficult because we're right now in a place where computers, meaning, so for example, I work on Chrome, so I'll talk about Chrome. When you hit something like an SSL error, Chrome currently can't really tell whether it's actually an attack or not an attack. So we're in this uncomfortable position where now we need to ask the user to make a decision. But unfortunately, in most cases, the user might actually have less knowledge of what's happening in that situation than Chrome itself does. So what I want, what, what my, me and my team are trying to do is uh, make Chrome smarter so that we can provide clear opinions, recommendations, and uh, tell people how to fix the problem instead of necessarily posing them a question. But this is actually a really hard technical challenge. Yeah, there's so many things that can be wrong. You know, when a connection gets open to another website, usually it's fine. But when something goes wrong, like, is it actionable? Like, for example, uh, there's a website that I manage, and um, actually I inherited it. And I just learned a couple of weeks ago that the SSL certificate has expired. But all of the people who use the website are super technical. So on the mailing list, they're like, hey, you know, search, search, you know, not working. So I have to click through the error. So I'm looking at it right now. It says your connection is not private. Attackers may be trying to steal your information from website. And then it has very, very small cert date invalid, right? It's completely clear to me what's wrong here. But I don't even know, like, this just means for parent, don't go here. But what could, could they fix this? There's 15 different things that could be wrong. It also mentions their clock, which my, my mom asked me a lot about. Yeah, so funny enough, we actually originally thought that developer errors were the cause of most ex expired certificate errors. But what we actually ended up finding is that a huge number of people changed the clocks on their phones and on their laptops. There really? are a lot of, yeah. Why are people doing that? So I don't know if you play <laughs> Candy Crush or any of these other games, but for a lot of them, you get a certain number of prizes, tokens, however you want to put it, per day. Okay. So it starts off, oh, hey, you realize you change your clock to tomorrow. Um, oh, no. Yeah, then you get more prizes. Okay, so pretty <laughs> soon you're in 2019. <laughs> and all of a sudden, using the internet, lots of things look like they're expired. And This is a thing? This is a real you problem we have. You are blowing my mind. And it turns out a huge number, like tens of millions a month of SSL errors are caused by people changing their clocks like that. I thought computers were all as NTP synchronized now. You can turn that off and change the date. So this wow. is actually something that we see pretty common. Now, we've built an, a new error, which will show Chrome has some heuristics in place to try to guess if the computer's clock is wrong, to try to guess if you're, we're seeing this kind of date drift. Hmm. And instead of showing an SSL, er, SSL error in that instance, we'll actually show something saying, hey, we think your clock is wrong. Please fix your clock instead of showing the scare, the scary message that you just read earlier. See, that would be great. That would be a, that would be an extremely useful thing. Like a plain English with screenshots like here's what's going on. Yeah, and we're working to look for for more things like that. So another example is sometimes if people have antivirus on their computer but don't have it installed correctly, it can lead to lots of errors while they're browsing the internet. So another thing that we're working on trying to do is identify when you've got some antivirus installed that hasn't been set up right and tell you, hey, you can keep it enabled, but you need to, to fix some configuration. Otherwise, you're going to keep seeing these errors all across the internet. I see. So configuration like having real time turned off or things like that, not having the plugin installed in the browser. Yeah, all these things can cause errors that 
often people can fix, they just don't know what it is they need to fix. See, I, I feel like the, the security internet is being split up between, you know, the knows and the don't knows, and it continues to make computers themselves scary and inaccessible to the regular person. Like, I, I don't want my family to think it's their fault. And it's that internalization where it's like, oh, I, they stole my credit card. I'm so sorry. It's my fault. And it's like, it's not your fault. Like, the bad guys are really bad. You know, but but my mom took it really personally. So there's a phrase we use on our team, which is don't pass along indecision. And what this means to us is if we're not sure what to do, it's kind of lame to then ask the user what to do instead. Mm -hmm. Now, get, we should give people control to choose what they want to do. But if we're in a really indecisive place, we shouldn't ask an equally indecisive user to have to make a decision, we should give them a recommendation so that if they're confused, they know what to do. Um, so this is something we're working on. But one thing that's important to, to point out, though, is that we're actually still in a place where, honestly, people who are otherwise very technical still don't always understand what's happening in terms of security. That is very true. So... For, for example, I was talking to someone the other day who was complaining to me about some changes that Chrome made with uh, how we treat um, SHA-1. And they had been to a website recently and saw an error and attributed it to this recent, you know, very technical policy change. Mm -hmm. And it turns out they're completely unconnected. Mm. It was a website that has self-signed self certificate, and that's why Chrome was showing an error. But this very technical person had conflated this, you know, technical news story that they had read with an error that they saw in person, and they were actually unrelated. And this mm. person was an engineer, right? So even very technical people sometimes get these things wrong. And so it's important to realize that even with a lot of technical savvy, security is a, is a, a niche area, a niche expertise. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I know that I've gotten nailed a couple of times by fake dialogues where they, they, the, the bad guy has drawn a dialog box and then popped up a picture of that dialog box and my muscle memory clicked okay but by then it's too late you know what i'm saying like it's like here's a picture of a javascript pop up and then by clicking it then i'm off and and running and i would be very embarrassed well i mean i'm, I'm saying it publicly but you know anyone would be embarrassed when they feel like they've it was as a direct result of their mistake but when they're actively tricked into doing something it's extremely frustrating yeah, I mean, I think it happens to all of us. So I, you know, I'm a security researcher, and I used to specifically study Android permissions. Hmm. And yet, when I go and install an Android application, I find myself <laughs> clicking through that dialogue without reading it. Yeah. And I'm the person who's done all this research on why don't people read these dialogues, right? So <laughs> it happens to all of us. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why I'm really glad that Android is moving to runtime permissions hmm. in um, M, because I think it'll help with that problem of people not looking at permissions during installation. What does that mean? So in the next release of Android, instead of showing the permission dialog as you install, when people are usually impatient, right? They're trying right. to install it as fast as they can. Yeah, it's in my way. It's standing between me and Candy Crush. Exactly. So what's going to happen instead is that after you install an application, the first time it needs to actually use a permission, it'll show you the prompt then. And ideally, it'll be in context. So let's say the first time you go to make, I don't know, um, a Skype call or something on your phone, as you're about to press, you know, the, the uh, call button, it'll then ask, oh, can we use your microphone? And that'll make sense, right? It, you're on your way to, to make a phone call. Of course, it needs your microphone. You'll click yes, as opposed to sort of burying this whole list of long things right during installation. Yeah, and sometimes the list of things are pretty scary. I, I have to admit that non-technical parents uh, have sent me screenshots of that. And, set, and they'll literally sit their phone down and say, all right, I'm going to put this down. Actually, I've had my dad take a picture of a phone with his other phone <laughs> and say, is this okay? And send me that. And it's a whole list of stuff. I'm like, I don't know. It wants full and complete control of your phone. How badly do you want this thing? Yeah, and, and that is a challenge because honestly, a lot of these powers are actually fairly scary powers. So hmm. for example, you know, any any anything that needs 
your microphone for legitimate reason, then has your microphone, right? Oh. Which is something that is a scary power in and of itself, even though it's clear and understandable. Well, because in context, I don't know, like, when do you want my microphone? Are you listening in the background? People are paranoid about things like that. Yeah, so I, I do hope that the context-driven permission request model, which Android is moving to and uh, Chrome already uses, I really do hope that that will help clarify some of that confusion. Mm -hmm. I want to pivot a little bit uh, and talk about something that, that I had to deal with in banking. So before I worked where I work now, I worked as a chief architect doing retail online banking, right when EVSSL was starting. So I was working with banks, trying to get them to go and get the special enhanced verification SSL certificate. And at the time, 2005, it was going to turn the the bar green on all the browsers. It was supposed to be a really great thing and tell you that there was implied trust, not just privacy. And this, I thought this was going to be amazing. Like, oh yeah, if your bank is green, that's awesome. And if it's not, that's a regular SSL cert. So all the technical people were talking to each other and thought this was awesome. But it turns out that now everyone just thinks that the little lock means trust when it really just means privacy. Yeah, this is, this is a hard problem for a few reasons. As you'll notice, um, Google.com itself actually doesn't have an EV certificate. Oh. And I'm... I love the dream of EV. So the dream of EV is what you described, that you can verify that a website is who they say they are because mm -hmm. a third party has checked, right? They've checked that when you go to mint.com, it's really mint.com and not someone trying to get your password. Right. Like but, they went there and like visited. That's what I always assumed. But there are a few problems with this. Um, the first is that often the companies that own the websites have a different name from the website you're going to. So a fairly famous example is that Intuit owns Mint. So you go to Mint, and then in big green letters it says Intuit. Yep. So that's a little confusing. The second issue is that currently the way EV is set up, if you can have a company named Intuit in a municipality in Germany, mm -hmm. and another one in Sweden, and another one in Japan... And as long as they're all companies that are registered there, they can all get an EV certificate with that company name on it. So there could mm -hmm. be 500 Googles out there with EV certificates for, say, Google, as long as they're actually named that in their municipality. Oh, wow. So it doesn't become, it's not quite as strong an indicator of verified identity as I like it to be. Right. So that means also that all of those certificates have to be, you know, well taken care of. And if the Google of Moldova gets compromised, then there's a EV certificate floating around somewhere that says Google. Right, right. That, that, yeah, that is a big problem. And you are totally right also um, on a second point about people conflating the trustworthiness of a website and the security of the connection to the website. And this is a really difficult thing to convey because most people have no concept of how the website is getting to them. Like connection security isn't a meaningful thing to them, right? They, they, they're looking at it on their computer and they don't know how it got there. Mm -hmm. And that's reasonable. Not everyone should have to know about surfers. But as a result, explaining what connection security is, is really difficult. And it's something that we're still struggling with. I remember I had a light bulb go off in my head a few months ago when we had um, uh, the UX researcher that we work with uh, brought some people in, and she was showing them uh, connection security indicators and warnings and asking people to talk about them. And at the time, one of the warnings said, this is not the site you're looking for. And it was supposed to be talking about a connection problem. But as people were looking at it, they're saying, oh, this is about phishing. I better look at the URL bar to check that it's the right URL. And I went, oh, my gosh. They're totally right. That does sound like it's about phishing. Oh, so we've been trying to address that, but without being able to explain really what a connection is or what a server is, people still very much conflate the two topics. There is so much context that is that is missing. Uh, I always try to put it in the context of uh, like a, a phone call. Uh, yesterday, true story, I get a phone call from my local area code uh, and I assumed it was someone I knew. And the person said, hi, I'm calling from the, the compliance office. And, and, he, and he spoke with such an authority 
that I felt suddenly that I was in compliant. <laughs> and, and he's like, you know, I'm calling about your business. I want to make sure that we get you. And I'm like, what office? And he just kept pushing through everything I would say. And I was like, and I, if I put it together, he had a burner phone. And he eventually just got frustrated with me and hung up. And then when I called back, the phone was dead. You know what I mean? So like, that's the kind of the man in the middle attack. Like what I should have done would be like, well, give me the number of the office where you are and I'll call you back and call through the receptionist. And and then we would have a trusting relationship here. But the initial level of the trust relationship was like looking at an address bar. It's like, ah, it seems legit. I remember there was a time a while back where someone had registered Microsoft.com with a Cyrillic C. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so people could click on it and it totally looked legit. So we, <laughs> yeah, that is a problem. It is pretty um, bad, isn't it? You know, this would have been easier to explain, I think, when I, like in the early 90s, when everyone was using landlines, because this is a great natural analogy. What uh, a, a designer that I work with, Alex Ainsley, came up with this idea of using an analogy of uh, someone picking up on the phone line. Mm-hmm. So, oh, okay, so you're talking to Google.com on the phone, and then maybe, you know, you're like, kid sister picks up and is listening to, right? So your kid sister here is a man in the middle attacker and the person you're talking to is, say, Google. And this is nice because there's two separate identities here that people can reason about. But the problem is, if you're a teenager today, you may have never really used a landline. Like the concept of someone picking up on a phone call may be just as abstract to you. Um, There are many countries where, you know, they sort of shot straight into the mobile technology without going through landlines first because perhaps they're in a remote area, whatever. And so that analogy fails for them. So we're still trying to figure out what another analogy is that would be as equally recognizable as, you know, that one would have been in the 80s or 90s with phones. That is a tough problem. Like, obviously, you're thinking about it much deep, more deeply than I am, but nothing jumps to mind. And I was literally showing a, an old movie to my kids. I think it was like the Goonies, you know, and that kind of iconic idea, like the phone rings. Hey, pick up the phone. Kid upstairs, pick up the phone. Okay, mom, hang up the phone. That was like our lives. And my children have absolutely no concept of any of that. Even our landlines of VoIP phone. <laughs> so one of the other things that you've worked on is uh, the malware warning. And uh, you're saying that a number of users click through that. They basically have gotten to the point where they just ignore the malware warning. And they're like, yeah, this could be unsafe. Yeah. And they click through. How, how does that research work? How do you find out why people ignore warnings? And how do you know how many people do, in fact, click through warnings and why? A few years ago, we started looking at how often people click through warnings. And I have to admit, we originally expected a really bleak picture. The common wisdom at the time was everyone clicks through warnings. So I went into this thinking, oh, 90% of people are going to be ignoring warnings. That was the prevailing wisdom in the community at the time. And it turned out that wasn't true. Although more people click through warnings than we would like, it wasn't anywhere near 90%. Actually, as of two years ago, it was about 30% of the time people would ignore the warning, but 70% of the time they would pay attention to it. So most of the time, people were heeding our advice. And since then, we've been improving the warnings and getting better at it. And now the rate is um, about 10%, maybe a little lower or higher, depending on the time period. And the way we've, we've done this is there, there are a few ways. So first of all, browsers like Chrome and Firefox have ways to pseudonymously tell whether someone has clicked through a warning or not. So we can, for people who have opted into sharing Um, some basic, we call it telemetry data, but what Mm -hmm. it means is we can see Booleans, like have you clicked through a warning or not that gets shared with, say, Google or with Mozilla. Mm -hmm. We can't see the URL, of course, but we can tell whether um, uh, people in aggregate are clicking through warnings or not. So Mm -hmm. we can use that information to compute what we call the click-through rate, which is how often people ignore the warning. And we also do things like have people come into a lab study and talk to a UX researcher and run mechanical Turk studies with controlled experiments where we try different types of UI. And we also ask people open-ended questions like, you know, what do you think this is learning is saying is a, is a really powerful question, even though it's so simple. And um, through all these different, all these different types of ways of asking people questions and seeing what their behaviors are, 
we can try to pinpoint factors that will influence people to not disregard our advice. Because actually, when it comes to safe browsing warnings, they are really accurate. It's not like SSL warnings. We have a very strong idea when there's malware being served on a page. So we're, we're very confident that the warnings are right, and we really don't want people to click through them. So brainstorming, why let them? Like, why not make it like really hard, like go to about flags and say, I'm really sure I'm needed. Like, why not make it so you just can't do it with a simple click? You know, this is actually a really controversial topic right now. Um, there are many differing opinions about, so there's a, a range of how paternalistic software can be, right? So I've never, on, that, that's a really interesting word, but that's great. I, applying paternal to the, yeah, the, the, the nanny state, right? How daddy-like should my browser really be? Oh, be careful, be, look both ways before you cross the road. Yeah, so there's a tension, right? We want to keep people safe, and we don't want to pass along indecision. We don't, we don't want to be asking people lots of questions. We kind of want the browser to do the right thing. But on the other hand, we want people to remain in control of technology. It's a bad feeling if your computer won't let you do something that you want to do, right? That's, that's not something that I enjoy when I encounter it. I find it frustrating that I can't do this thing I want to, I really want to do. So... We have a, a delicate trade-off between all, the, all these different factors, and where we're currently at for malware warnings is we try to make it somewhat difficult to click through the warning. Like, you have to click on details first, and then there's a link if you hunt around for it in the text. Hmm. So it's not, you know, there's not like a big red button, click here to, to, <laughs> to, to go to this page with malware. We, we definitely discourage it and we share an opinion and you have to really want to find it to find it, but we still let you do it if you really want to. Interesting. I, I was, as you were saying that, I'm thinking, but you're making self-driving cars. But, <laughs> but I was watching um, uh, The Fifth Element and he turns off the self-driving feature to consciously crash the car and the car's like, you're going to crash. He's like, no, I'm really, I'm, I mean to crash. It's okay. I know what I'm doing. That makes total sense. Yeah, for clarity, I think the self-driving cars still let the people drive. <laughs> well, yeah, you can always flip it. In. I know, I'm just saying, you can always flip it. In. I'm just thinking about all the movies, like the one where Arnold Schwarzenegger goes to Mars and he gets into the Johnny Cab and uh, the Johnny Cab is, just drives him around. He's not allowed to do that at all. And he end, ends up having to take control of the car because it it's very much wants to get him where he wants to go. Yeah, I mean, I want to be healthy, but I also don't want my f freezer to refuse to unlock to get me to the ice cream, right? So it, it is a trade-off. <laughs> That is an awesome analogy. That's fantastic. Interesting. Okay. So um, what kinds of uh, studies are you running right now? We've talked about some of the ones that you've done in the past, and you've been doing this for years and years. Yeah. So right now, one of our main efforts is called the Chrome User Experience Survey Platform. And we've been asking people to install an extension. And the extension will periodically survey you um, if you do something, if you encounter a warning, or if you, you know, interact with the URL bar in a certain way, or do a different set of things, every once in a while, it'll show you hmm. a little notification and ask you to tell us about what just happened in your experience with that interaction with that piece of UI. And we, we've had some success with this, several thousand people have installed it thus far. And I'm really grateful that they have, because the data that we're getting back is very insightful. We're, we're seeing in context what people are thinking about these different pieces of UI that we're showing them. What is it called? That's, I thought that sounds super interesting. I love stuff like that. Like I like, there's some features in Windows where if you do something, it's like, you know, you could have used a hotkey. It's like, oh, I totally forgot. I love stuff like that. What it's, is this called? It's the Chrome User Experience Survey, and it's in the, um, the Chrome Web Store with extensions under the By Google tab. Okay, cool. Chrome User Experience Surveys. We'll go ahead and we'll add that to the show notes to make sure that people can, can check that out. And is it, it's pretty passive. It just kind of watches and says, oh, that looks interesting what you just did. Take a quick survey about it. Yeah, exactly. And it's capped, so it won't show you lots of surveys. It, it surveys fairly infrequently. Okay, cool. So it's not nagging you all the time. No, right. That would be annoying. Interesting. So you also worked, like you said, uh, on, um, on privacy and security on, on phones. Yeah. So my, that was actually my dissertation work in graduate school was looking mm. at permission systems. So for Chrome extensions and for Android applications. Um, to look at how well the permission model works. And a permission model is when you see an application asking, hey, can I have access to location? That kind of thing. 
Mm-hmm. In the uh, in the title of your uh, one of your papers, you said, "I've got ninety nine problems, but vibration ain't one." <laughs> I thought that was pretty a pretty fantastic uh, title. If you're going to do one, yeah. So vibration is actually a funny thing because it isn't really a security risk. It's more just a possible annoyance. But yet we see that social engineering sites love it. They want to get your attention, right? They want you. They want to use this to get your attention to look at their piece of you know their fake pop-up or whatever it is that they're trying to sell you, they want to get your attention. So they're using the Vibrate API. So weirdly enough, even though people don't find Vibrate a particularly threatening permission to have, we see it being fairly widely used annoyingly. So it's kind of an odd situation with that specific API. I think, though, also, to, to, and again, I, I have only my parents as, as my, uh, my user base. Uh, I'm IT support for, you know, your, our fa- we're all, we're, I'm sure you are as well, right? We're all IT support for our family. Um, they feel that the, there's some authenticity in the vibrate, though. When the phone vibrates, it was the phone that vibrated, as opposed to the site told the phone, can you vibrate for me? So when a vibration occurs, they perceive it as being from the core of the phone and it has more more weight it's more important yeah it's it's true i i think it does do that and that's why these bad sites are trying to make use of the vibration api but on the other hand when you ask people you know how concerning do you find the vibrate api um would you always say people say why are you even asking me it's vibrate just go ahead and give it it doesn't right to, to them it, it they don't I don't think people consciously realize the effect that using vibration has on them. Mm, I see what you're saying. So they approve it, and they've forgotten about it. And then, you know, weeks later, a site uses it or an app uses it, and they compl- And another thing, actually, is how do you take those things back? With all fo- phones, on all platforms, I've always found it difficult to revoke permissions. Like, I just click accept, and it's done, but I have to go digging to make you stop using it. Yeah, revocation is actually something we've been working on a lot, and that, mm. you'll see that story getting better. So for Android, in starting in M, you'll see that you can now take back permissions and settings, which you didn't used to be able to do before, so that's a, mm. a new thing. And also on Chrome, if you've given a permission to a website, just click on the lock, and right there will be a list of all the permissions you've given, and you can easily flip them back. And we've been making lots of improvements there. Because one of the things we worry about is, A, people want to you know, try stuff out, right? And they're not going to try it out if they're afraid that they can't undo it. So we want to make it a lot easier to undo. And there's been a lot of work going on around that. And also, we actually, we, we don't want to annoy people. We would sometimes like to be able to guess, hey, yeah, okay, you're going to say yes to allow this website to use Vibrate. But then if it starts annoying you, you should still be able to undo it. So having a better verification story lets us experiment a little bit more with what APIs are available without asking the user about it first. And of course, we'd never do that for anything privacy sensitive. But for ones like Vibrate that are mostly about obnoxiousness, it gives us some flexibility. Very cool. I really appreciate you chatting with me today. Thanks. It was nice talking. Dr. Adrienne Porterfeld is a security and privacy researcher at Google, and she's currently focused on designing and building usable security. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.